Welcome to the 25th episode of the series Decolonizing the Mind. Uh, this is the last uh, session of the series about current, the sub-series about the current narratives about civilizations. <clears throat> In previous uh, sessions of this sub-series, uh, I dealt with Russia, China, India, Africa, uh, Latin Abiyala. Um, I'll now turn to Oceania. Uh, but as usual, before I go there, uh, let's look at, at what the situation in uh, Palestine is now. We have these staggering numbers, 24,000 people killed, mostly women and children, 60,000 wounded in Palestine. And yet, <clears throat> after 100 days of relentless bombing by the Zionists, uh, the support of the West and the US in particular, we still see that the support for resistance is, is great, is big. And the war in the uh, north of Israel, uh, at the border with Lebanon, with Hezbollah, <clears throat> Uh, you might think that uh, because of Hezbollah's involvement uh, in supporting uh, the resistance in Gaza by uh, opening up a front in the north, that it would lead to uh, discontent within Lebanon itself. The American Washington Institute conducted a poll that shows that Hezbollah has increased uh, its popularity compared to the last poll which they held uh, uh, three years ago. And that support for the Hamas movement was widespread uh, in the Lebanese society. <clears throat> Almost 80% of the Lebanese have a positive opinion of Hamas, while the perception of a military solution to the conflict with the occupation rather than a political solution is much more widespread in Lebanon than in other countries. So in Lebanon, where they feel the heat of the Zionist uh, oppression and, 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 and war, they don't think that the political solution will be viable, that in the end of the day, a military solution will solve uh, this problem. And there's even overwhelming consensus in Lebanese society, uh, namely 99%, almost 100%, that Arab countries should immediately suffer their all contacts with Israel protests against the ongoing war in the Gaza Strip. So <clears throat> this is significant because it tells you that the support, despite the massive destructions uh, and, and, and uh, relentless uh, war uh, destruction by the Zionists, the spirit is still high in the Arab world, specifically in Lebanon. Now, let's go to Oceania. <clears throat> Oceania is a region in the South Pacific Ocean that comprises of 14 countries, Australia, Papua New Guinea, New Zealand, Fiji, the Solomon Islands, the Federated States of Micronesia, Vanuatu, Samoa, Kiribati, Tonga, the Marshall Islands, Palau, Tuvalu, and Nauru. It's important to know that, you know, these countries, many of them, you won't hear about them in the news, uh, but they are still part of that larger region. We often hear, obviously, about uh, New Zealand and Oceania uh, and Australia. Now, when you talk about uh, another world civilization that takes into account the thinking of the original uh, population of uh, this region, then there's always this problem of terminology. Um, in Australia, they use different denominations, First Nation people, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders people, Indigenous Australians. Um, so, you know, uh, these are the common things, you know, I just pick one, it could be another one for now, just the First Nation people. In New Zealand, they are called the Maoris and the Maoris called 
the country of New Zealand, they have a specific name for it. <coughs> it's called Aotearoa. And um, if you look, <coughs> <coughs> sorry, <coughs> apologies. If you look at the demography of Australia, uh, of uh, the Oceania, of the 14 countries, Australia is the largest. There are 26 million people, and 4% of them uh, identified as apparently an official uh, denomination, indigenous Aboriginal Australians and Torres Strait Islanders. I guess that is the term they use in the census. <clears throat> in Papua New Guinea, they have 10 million people. In New Zealand, Aotearoa is 5 million, of which 17% identify as Maori. And in Fiji, of 900,000, Solomon Islands, 700,000. And the other islands are, have smaller populations. The struggle of the First Nation people in Australia has resulted in the establishment since 1998 uh, of May 26 as a National Sorry Day to remember and commemorate the mistreatment of the indigenous population. There's a National Sorry Day Committee that has programs for schools across Australia to support teachers who plan events to commemorate National Sorry Day. The National Sorry Day is an annual event of education and reconciliation. Developing programs of immaterial reparation is an important element in decolonizing the mind. The Maoris are saying we are a Polynesian country, we are Aotearoa. The Maori campaign to change the country's official name to Aotearoa uh, has been going on and is part of a larger campaign to rename uh, the town, cities, and place names to uh, original Maori names. Now, recently, uh, the uh, right wing government came into power. Uh, in uh, Aotearoa, and they have announced the, uh, you know, the uh, policy of dissolving the country's Maori health authority. There was a health authority that paid specific specific in, uh, attention with the budget to the Maori people. They want to roll back the use of the Maori language, and they want to end the country's limit on tobacco sales that was introduced to cut high rates of smoking among Maori people. So <clears throat> they want to get the Maori people addicted to tobacco. Um, and they want to organize a future referendum on the principle of the New Zealand Treaty of Waitangi, a document signed by the colonial British regime and Maori in 1840 that enshrines principles of co-governance between indigenous and non-indigenous uh, New Zealanders. Now, uh, looking at the philosophies that uh, indigenous people have developed in those region, um, I, I, I must acknowledge that I had a bit of a problem in, in getting documents and there, there must be a lot of uh, information there which I couldn't access in some way. Uh, but what I what I found is that the basis of their philosophy is that they link humans to nature, and they tie this up to land. And a First Nation uh, people thinker, Patrick Dutchin, says to understand our law, our culture, and our relationship to the physical and spiritual world, <clears throat> you must begin with the land. Everything about Aboriginal society in, is inextricably woven with and connected to the land. Culture is the land, and the land and the spirituality of Aboriginal people, our cultural beliefs, or reason for existence is the land. You take away and you take away your you, you take that away and you take away our reasons for existence. We have grown the land up. 
We are dancing, singing, and painting for the land. We are celebrating the land. Remove from our lands, we are literally removed from ourselves. So they have a very uh, uh, elaborate philosophy, apparently, about the humans and nature connected through the land. <clears throat> Another Maori philosopher, uh, Linda Tuhiwai Terina Smith, uh, has written a book on decolonizing knowledge, um, explains that um, the concept of space and time in the West um, is different from the Maori. Uh, in the Maori uh, philosophy, the word for time and space is the same. Uh, there are other indigenous languages that have no related word for either space or time. Uh, and instead, they have a series of very precise terms for part of these ideas or for relationships between the idea and something else in the environment. There are positions within time and space in which people and events are located, but these cannot necessarily be described as distinctive categories of thought. Time is associated with social activity and how people organize their daily life. And what is the purpose of life? Uh, in the relationship between work and leisure. Linda Smith goes into how the mind has been colonized through colonial education. <coughs> she said, this happens, <coughs> this happens in two basic forms, missionary or religious schooling, which was often residential, followed later by public and secular schooling. Numerous accounts across nations now attest to the critical role played by schools in assimilate, assimilating uh, colonized people and in the systemic, frequent, brutal forms of denial of indigenous language, knowledge, and cultures. And she points out how the um, different views of, of colonialism uh, and the colonial history uh, from the Maori perspective and from the perspectives of uh, uh, the Europeans. <clears throat> In the European view, the colonial view, they have a phase which is the initial discovery and contact, the decline of the population, the phase of accult acculturation of the Maoris, of then the assimilation, and then the reinvention as a of the New Zealand society, Aotearoa society as a hybrid ethnic culture. In the Maori decolonial view, the first phase is contact and invasion. They use the term invasion, not discovery, not you know. And then they don't use population decline, but genocide and destruction. Uh, it's a different view than. And they don't use acculturation and assimilation, but resistance and revival. And they don't use reinvention of a hybrid ethnic culture, but the recovery as indigenous peoples. So you see, there's a different concept of the whole history of Aotearoa. <clears throat> now, um, because of, you know, from Chinese philosophy, Islamic philosophy, uh, uh, Hindu philosophy. There are a lot of literature there which I, I could access. So I apologize for not being able to uh, get as much information as I have from the other uh, civilizational uh, backgrounds. Um, and then there are other contributions which I don't go into, like Buddhism and, and so on. Not that not I I I didn't want to, but. Uh, there's a limitation of time and, and you can't do everything. <clears throat> but we need experts to get involved in teaching us about these legacies and the contribution towards a new world civilization. Um, I will do a new sub-series uh, starting from next week, and which is a series of dialogue with thinkers from different civilizations. And I will start with a dialogue with Imam Muhammad Al-Asi, who's based in Washington, 
and who has been doing uh, a gigantic work on explaining the Quran. He has uh, published 15 volumes out of 45 uh, on uh, each verse of the Quran, where he explains the Quran, he's an expert uh, on it. <clears throat> and he was so gracious to uh, agree to get in a dialogue with me. Uh, so we'll have a couple of weeks uh, of dialogues with him. And after that, I'll go back to the book uh, and deal with some theory and then later on try to get another thinker involved in these dialogues. <coughs> Next week, in fact, coming weekend, I will be giving DTM courses in London and in Birmingham. You could find more information on sandohira.com slash events. Uh, uh, I will return on Monday in the late afternoon. So I will do my um, podcast in the evening. Uh, and if you want to read more about Australia and Aotearoa, New Zealand, look at the index of my book. Uh, you could download the PowerPoint, uh, the www.sandohira.com. And if you want to support the channel, subscribe to it, share, with it with your friends and families and colleagues and encourage them to subscribe and like it get involved in discussion group and if you want to make a donation uh look at um, sandohira.com how you can do that uh, thank you for your attention